Tonight, Brother Gene is going to be speaking to us from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father hath sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, then they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas said with them, Jesus came, the doors being, sh being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Well, then you're all very familiar with this account. The things that are revealed herein concerning the, appearance, the appearances of the Savior. Now, these words, of course, follow after the Lord's initial appearance to the women that morning. And they came and told the brothers the disciples, that they had seen the Lord. Peter and John went to the tomb, saw the uh, condition of it, his body being gone, the grave clothes as they were there, giving evidence <laughs> that the Lord had done this. John records that he went away believing. He says that disciple went away believing. And yet, Mark tells us that they, many, of, many of the twelve did not believe the women. You remember that account. And that evening then, in Mark's same account of this Resurrection Day appearance, Jesus appeared to them and reprimanded them for not believing what was told them. The two on the road to Emmaus accounted this to Jesus. We were amazed, they said, when some of our women came and told us they had seen him. And some went and investigated the tomb, but him they did not see. And Jesus reprimanded them as well. Of course, they didn't know it was Jesus. But their hearts burned within them when he spoke the scriptures to them. When he opened up the scriptures to them, their heart, their heart burned in them. Now, some would say that this whole accounting then contradicts what the Savior says here at the end of this record. That is, blessed is he who is not seen and yet believed. So why did he reprimand them? Why did he appear to the women? And why did he reprimand them? In that manner, it, 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 why did he appear to anyone then? <laughs> if they were blessed for not seeing, well, the Lord was establishing the testimony, and they were the chosen witnesses. They were the chosen witnesses. He did expect them to believe. He had spoken to them about these events for several months now. He began speaking very plainly about this at his transformation. At, when he appeared on the on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. And of course, they didn't understand. They discussed with one another, Peter, James, and John discussed with one another what he meant by rising from the dead. Because in their perception, it could not have been that he would really die. So there must be some figure to it, they thought. 
These things had not yet been opened to them, but they were the chosen witnesses. In fact, Peter gives that account, and Peter and Paul both use that language in their preaching of this message and in their reporting of the events that took place. That he appeared to certain ones that were chosen beforehand. He did not appear to anyone. You, we all know he didn't appear to his enemies. He didn't appear to the Sanhedrin. He didn't appear to Pilate. He didn't appear to any of the ungodly and the unbelieving. He did appear to these believers. They were believers. But as the record tells us, for joy, even when he appeared to them, for joy, they could hardly believe. They, they weren't willing to believe their own five senses, or however many that they would use, you know, three or, two or three of them. Their hearing, and their sight, and their touch, three of them at least, said, touch me. It was, it was such a staggering event for them, and yet our Lord states this blessing. which I have interpreted to be believing, is seeing. Seeing this truth. That he was who he claimed to be. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now, brethren, I want us to, to uh, uh, recount this this evening. The evening of the resurrection. Because these things have been declared to us and we've not seen. And I want us to... to uh, be affirmed <laughs> in our faith. Because we're not talking about a religious holiday here, are we? Amen. Now, the world may be, but we're not. Not at all. And we trust that there are many out there in the nominal church that to them this was not a holiday. It was not, it was not a day just for a family meal of gathering together for the children to do some, any number of things that they might do that we might... Uh, attached to this day. It is the anniversary of our Lord's resurrection. Amen. And we have met together early this morning. Yes. Amen. We've extended ourselves, giving extra time and attention to the scriptures today because we want to see. Amen. We have believed and we want to see these yes. things. Now, we're not expecting the Lord to appear in this room to give us proof and evidence. <laughs> we trust the record. We trust the testimony that God has given concerning his son. Now, these witnesses did as well. They did. Once these things were established in their hearts and minds, the Lord ordained then the preaching, the report, the announcement, the declaration of this reality that God had done, he ordained these things to be proclaimed and announced by their preaching. He appointed this, that salvation be granted by believing this message, you see. Not by him appearing to everyone that heard it. He did appear to certain ones, and we have that accounting. Paul gives it to us. There in 1 Corinthians 15, he... he uh, uh, gives a, a, a little different account. He doesn't mention the women in this account. You know it. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 7, I preached, I declared to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word. See, these, this, this letter, of course, is where Paul affirms that God is saving those who believe this message that is preached. He makes that statement at the beginning of this letter. And now here he reminds them of this thing at the, at the closing of the letter. In what we call chapter 15, I delivered you of first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. They declared this boldly. I'm going to go through these accounts here from the book of Acts where they went about stating this. No physical evidence. In fact, we know, don't we? The physical evidence was taken away. We don't know that that tomb that is, in, that, is, that is in the Holy Land now, that some say was the tomb and so forth, we don't know that it is. 
There's no markings there. The Lord hasn't designated. A, he didn't leave any kind of uh, marking in the stone that this is the spot and so forth and so on. Absolutely not. It's the testimony of generations and so forth of Christians, but the apostles never, not one time in the record, the Holy Spirit is preserved for us, did they ever speak about going to that tomb. They never directed any listener to go to the tomb and investigate for themselves. Nothing was said on the day of Pentecost. No one brought forth the grave clothes. None whatsoever. None, none of the, the uh, soldiers were brought forth. To give a testimony, of course, they, on a human level, they wouldn't, of course. They were paid hush money. Plus, we know what would have been done to them by their superiors if they came out in the public. It's likely that those, I wouldn't be surprised at all if the men deserted, left town as fast as they could, put on civilian clothes, and got out of town. For we know what happened to the squads of soldiers guarding Peter, don't we? This was a bigger issue than Peter, at, at this point anyway. And these men, asleep, on guard detail, of course we know they weren't asleep. They passed out for fear of the angel that appeared to them. And they weren't going to talk to anybody about that. They were glad to take that money and get out of town. It's likely what they used the money for was to separate themselves from Jerusalem and these Jews and the Roman army and get out of town to save their necks, literally. But the apostles don't appeal to that, do they? At all. No. The word was spread there in Jerusalem that the disciples came and stole his body away and that was accepted by the masses. But these men then came preaching a different message. Paul says he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Now why he didn't give the account of the women seeing him? Well, that account's given in another place, isn't it? <laughs> the Holy Spirit's covered that. It doesn't have to be repeated again. It could have been, but it doesn't have to be. We have that account in another place. And those there in Judea, in Jerusalem, Judea, the brethren, the believers there, those willing to believe, knew well the account of those dear sisters. And Paul was not writing to anyone in Judea or Jerusalem. He was writing to believers in Corinth who would not have any direct connection to that anyway. And so he's speaking to them about those whom they could uh, speak to, whom they would likely hear preach would have some connection with. They would hear about James, leader of the church in Jerusalem. They would hear about him. And so that carried weight with them. And of course, Paul was their father in the faith. And he says, I saw him. He appeared to me last of all. So, physical evidence removed, yet they spoke boldly of this resurrection. These men who were the chosen witnesses, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, God, whom God raised up after, after affirming to them that they had chosen his execution. His own people, you, his own people, chose for him to be put to death by the hands of godless men. But of course he also reveals in that statement that God delivered him up to you. And according to God's predetermined will and purpose, his plan, he was put to death by you, by the hands of godless men, but whom God raised up. He declares this boldly, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Then the second time in chapter 3, in his announcement of these things, he says, whom he, you killed the prince of life, you asked for a murder to be granted to you, and killed the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. In chapter 4 then, standing before the Sanhedrin, Peter and John, alone, just those two. After being questioned by them about the Good deed done toward the crippled man at the gate beautiful said, 
by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole, fearlessly, boldly. Amen. They declared without, without, again, without any reference to any physical evidence. These were the men who paid the bribe, weren't they, to the soldiers to spread the lie. Peter and John don't mention that. They simply, according to their commission, declare this message and challenge these, these men about their unbelief. That's what this is. Peter's, I don't think at all Peter's expecting them to change their minds. This is a testimony against them. He knows they're not going to change their mind, just as our brother Stephen knew later, didn't he? He knew they weren't changing their minds. He knew that they were prepared to remove him. Peter and John were prepared for that. Later on, the disciples were prepared for that. In chapter 5, when all of them stood before the sin eater, they were prepared to be put to death, weren't they? Yes, they were, but they were going to declare this message. They were going to state it as they'd been commanded to state it. They were absolutely beyond a shadow convinced of these things. And the, they were, more than that, they were convinced of the implications of these things. And so they began to do, and so they continued to declare these implications and challenge their hearers. Every opportunity they got to speak, they would challenge their hearers to turn in faith and repentance. Well, they didn't challenge the Sanhedrin that way, did they? <laughs> they simply said, we're not going to stop. Amen. We're not going to stop speaking about these things that we have seen. We cannot stop speaking. You decide whether it's right for us to obey you rather than God. What a, what a challenge. That wasn't a question, by the way. That was an in-your-face, line-in-the-dirt challenge. You decide. We have already decided, Amen. and we will not change our decision. We're going to speak this message. We, we are going to declare our witness and testimony of the things that have been revealed to us. Amen. Now again, some would say that they're just seeing what they believe, that they've imagined these things. They wanted it so badly that they've just conjured all of this up in their minds. <laughs> some would say that. Yes, some would say that. But they are the chosen witnesses. They are the ones that the Lord has appointed. This is God's plan of salvation. <laughs> some of us are more familiar with that phrase than others here. Plan of salvation. That this message of Jesus' sacrifice be declared. His sacrifice, his death burial and resurrection be declared as God led them they went about declaring this message wherever they had an, wherever they had an audience wherever they had an, an opportunity and God made the opportunities didn't he in Jerusalem in Judea in Samaria the next one I want to remind you of is the one in Caesarea where God made the appointment with the Roman Cornelius sent a messenger to his home who told him, you send messengers and to Joppa and find Peter. He will bring you a message by which you and your household will be saved. So he did. Peter, by God's direction, then followed that leading, arrived at Cornelius' house and delivered this message. We are witnesses of all the things which he did in the land of the Jews. He reminded them, you're familiar with these things about Jesus of Nazareth. And the, the household was familiar with them. They, they had heard about these things. That's why he could speak that way with them. But they needed to be in the, the, the things they'd been heard, the things they had heard about, the few things they'd heard about needed to be enlarged upon and needed to be interpreted for them. And Peter was the chosen interpreter, if you will, being a chosen witness. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to chosen witnesses. Witness, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. 
So they were very forthright in declaring this reality, urging the hearers to believe, to believe the words, to believe the message, not to believe some evidence that was given. Their words were the evidence, the substance, if people were willing to believe it at all. Going on in the record there in Acts chapter 13, as this text was mentioned this morning. Acts chapter 13, Paul and Silas, pre, or Paul and Barnabas preaching in the synagogue there in Antioch, Antioch of Pisidia. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, this is when Paul was invited to speak. He had a message to deliver. Now, when all they, ha they had now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. There's the evidence right there that was presented to the audience in the synagogue. People who knew the scriptures, they could follow right along with all the things Paul had mentioned up to this point. That God had a chosen one he's going to send into the earth and do a great work in him. They took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. Now, Paul was not of that number, that direct number. He was one to whom the Lord appeared to later as one born out of time. But he also was a chosen witness. Later on then, Paul would speak to the philosophers in Athens. And he concluded his message. He'd, he'd been there for some time, speaking in the synagogue and debating in the marketplace. That's what the record says, daily in the marketplace and on the Sabbath in the synagogue. So he was appealing to the Jews and to the Gentiles as well, out in the street, places where they would meet together an occasion to speak about these things, spiritual things. And he says, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Amen. And there's the evidence that Paul gave to these Greek philosophers. Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, men who had widely divergent views of the purpose of life and how they, their lives should be fulfilled and how their lives would, should be directed for righteousness, you might say, for doing what is right and good. And so he boldly just declared this truth to them. I mentioned earlier uh, that Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 had, all, had told the Sanhedrin, we cannot but speak the things which we had seen and heard. Then later Peter would declare to them, along with the other apostles, in the, in the second meeting, or, or the second challenge by the Sanhedrin, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God exalted. See, he stated it twice. God raised him up, and now him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Stephen, of course, had a little different perspective in declaring the resurrection. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That was his declaration of the resurrection. Amen. Very unique. <laughs> and, of course, they rushed on him, dragged him out of the city, and stoned him. Luke also recorded a couple of other comments about the preaching of the apostles. In chapter 4, with great power. The apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. It was having a, a, a cumulative effect. Their witness, their preaching, and the rising tide of faith in the city was having a great and powerful effect. That's why the Sanhedrin arrested all the apostles later and threatened them, had them, had them, 
whipped, had them beaten, and ordered them no more to speak in this name. And then, of course, after the stoning of our brother Stephen, the great persecution arose, and Luke records, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word, mm -hmm. declaring these things for the hearers to believe. And it had a great effect. On the day of Pentecost, the audience interrupted, said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Later on, at the preaching of this word, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the captain of the temple, they were greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And so they asserted themselves against these common men, Peter and John, common men. But even they recognized they'd been with Jesus. They spoke with the same spirit and fervor and devotion and steadfastness. Jesus would not change his message. They would not change their message either, despite their threats. You intend to bring this man's blood on us. And, of course, the disciples said yes. In several different ways, they said, yes, we're going to bring his blood upon you. <laughs> we're going to declare that you are responsible for killing the prince of life. They said it, didn't they? Stephen said it. Peter and John said it when they were there, just the two of them. The rest of the disciples said it. But God raised him from the dead. They boldly declared. Amen. Believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of men and women. Luke records in chapter 5. And that's after he also said that some wouldn't touch them. Some wouldn't have anything to do with them because of, of course, the death of Ananias and Sapphira. Yes, sir. They, were, they were fearful of aligning with them, yet some could not resist and believe the message that they preached. In the city of Samaria, where Philip was, the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. And of course, he was not one of the chosen witnesses, was he? So see, the effect of this message was, was uh, uh, increasing <laughs> in a way that, the, the, that the, uh, the enemies of the message couldn't account for. They couldn't handle it anymore even though one of them was trying desperately. And, and he was willing to give himself as a tool and assert himself against the preachers of this message who believed things they had not seen and were transformed by it and were giving themselves in unprecedented fashion and numbers. They could, they could, hardly, <laughs> they could hardly keep up with the increase of believers of this message. God continued to direct. The Spirit said to Philip, go down to the road. Directed him to meet someone there, a eunuch, traveling from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia, reading the scriptures. And Philip ran up, empowered, ran up beside the chariot, heard him reading, spoke to him about what he was reading, and the eunuch invited him to come and sit with him. And he did. And the eunuch questioned him, and Philip began at that place and preached unto him Jesus. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Having not seen, he believed the things spoken by Philip. Later on then in Caesarea, Peter speaking the words, the Holy Spirit fell on the audience, this Gentile audience. There were Jews, believing Jews there among them. 
and they were astonished at the things that they saw. The circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out, poured out upon the Gentiles also. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Peter said, can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who receive the Holy Spirit just as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Those who had not seen yet believed. And they asked him to stay many days. Some Jews went to Antioch, Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word. Some from Cyprus and Cyrene who had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord, though they had not seen. They believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. <laughs> Later on then, of course, the Holy Spirit would send Peter, I'm sorry, Paul and Barnabas out for the work to which he had called them. And they would leave Antioch, travel down to Cyprus. And a proconsul, the, the, the Roman proconsul, the Roman governor of the, of the island, called them in. A, being an intelligent man, Luke says, he was an intelligent man. He'd heard these things about God and Christ. He wanted to hear more. And these men were in town. And, and had a reputation that they were speakers and knowledgeable of these things. He wanted to know more. And the proconsul believed, though he had not seen. Now, he did see some signs. Yes, he did. He saw Bar Jesus stricken blind, who tried to interfere with this message. He was, he was attracted to it anyway. This just confirmed. That opposition to God and his truth will be removed. <laughs> In some form or fashion, it will be taken out of the way. Amen. And so the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. They went on to Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, preaching the word. Stirred up the congregation so much. Many of the Jews, devout proselytes, followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. And of course, some objected. Paul and Barnabas shook out their clothes, said, your blood be on your own heads. Now we'll turn to the Gentiles. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed, though they had not seen. Mm -hmm. This word was doing its work. The Holy Spirit was convicting men concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment by the proclamation, by the report of the things that God had done. It happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews. And so spoke that a great multitude of the Jews and Greeks believed. Though they had not seen. Later on in chapter 16 it records that they entered the city of Philippi went to a place by the river where they found some women, godly, devout women, and spoke the message to them. A certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God, and the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us, though she had not seen. She believed. Later on in that same city, of course, they were arrested and jailed in the dungeon. An earthquake occurred, and the jailer had heard something. The word of God had pierced his heart and mind. <laughs> and when he heard that, the, that they had not escaped from the jail and the earthquake, he went in, called for lights, and said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Though he had not seen, yet he believed. And that very hour, he took them to their house, 
They spoke the word of God to him and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house before he washed their stripes, their wounds. Though they had not seen, yet they believed. Later on, they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a thin synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went in and for three Sabbaths reasoned with the Jews, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some were persuaded. And a great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few leading women joined Paul and Silas, though they had not seen they believed. Brethren in Berea, when they arrived, they went to the synagogue of, Jude of the Jews. They received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and not also a few Greeks, prominent women, as well as men, in Berea, in Berea. In the Areopagus, some of the men joined them. In Athens later, some of the men joined them and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Demarius, and others with them, though they had not seen, they believed. He reasoned in Corinth, in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks, though they had not seen, they believed. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized, though they had not seen. In Ephesus, after speaking in the synagogue, he withdrew the disciples, went to the school of Tyrannus. He departed with them, withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And we know that's when many churches were established during that time. Though they had not seen, they believed. Last of all, then, in Rome. They appointed a day. Many came. He explained and solemnly testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening, and some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved, though neither had seen. Those who were appointed to eternal life, those who received the love of the truth, see, all of, all of these are expressions, expository expressions about what happens when a person believes these things that have been made known, these things ordained, these things delivered to them. The same things we have believed, brethren, the same things. This is what God has worked in us. This is what we have written in the letter to the church in Rome, the two letters to the church in Corinth, the letter to the churches in Galatia. Say he's declaring to them what God, the work that God did in their hearts, the letter to the church in in Ephesus, in Colossae, in Philippi, the letter to the believers in Thessalonica. Let me read you that text there where he says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you. Now, these are believers who only been believers a few weeks. Most of them Gentile believers, likely. Mm -hmm. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake, and you became followers of us in the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, though they had not seen. This, this is Paul's personal account. Besides what Luke wrote, this is Paul's personal account of what took place there in Thessalonica before they were chased out of the city. And the Jews from Thessalonica then followed them to Berea. Made trouble there. They had to leave Berea under threat of the unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica. The people in Berea were more noble 
They were willing to consider these things. The unbelievers in Thessalonica weren't even willing to let them speak. But many believed, though they had not seen. Now, these are experiences that we have had as well, brethren. As the word of God came to us in power, some of us very young, many of you very young, but the word of God has come to you, you have believed it, and it has begun its work in you, giving evidence of these things by your works of faith, your labors of love, and patience of hope. And we'll see more of that patience, of course, and more of that work of faith, and more of those labors of love as time goes on. And God proves these things in you as he has proven these things in us. Many of us who became believers at, very, at a very young age, many of us who, who began giving ourselves to the word of God and to his truth and speaking about these things at a very young age, many of us who longed to have a fellowship like this where these things were spoken about openly and there was an open exchange and a willing and a glad a gladness and a rejoicing in God's truth like we have here, like I have never seen or experienced in any other place. But I did everything I could to provoke it in several other places. But there was never any receiving of it like there has been here. And God had to draw us from many places, didn't he? From many places, he's drawn us to this place. At this time, in this generation. Though not seeing, we have believed. And God has worked these things in us. Paul wrote these words to the believers in Colossae. whom, as far as we know, he, he knew only the household of Philemon. We don't know precisely when he was there, how he had met them. Perhaps they came to Ephesus and met him during that, that uh, two-year period that he was teaching in the school of Tyrannus. Perhaps that's, that's when he met them, became close to them. So while he was in Rome then, God brought him together with Onesimus, Philemon's runaway slave. And led by God, he sent Onesimus back to Colossae with that letter that we know as the letter of Philemon. Very short, very personal. The apostle knew that man, trusted that man's faith and what God had worked in him, that he could write back to him and ask him to do something that was absolutely and totally in violation of the culture. And what all of his neighbors and friends and, pro and perhaps family would tell him, you punish that slave. You make an example of him for everyone who knows you. And Paul was saying, please forgive him. And if he owes you anything, you charge that to my account. And please send him back to me. He's a great help to me in the work of the kingdom. And, of course, he also sent this letter to all the believers there. And he said, we give thanks to God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before, of which you heard before, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. So you see, believing, they were seeing. Uh -huh. Believing these things about what God said he would do and that God has fulfilled his word in his own dear son. Things that these, uh, these Gentiles never entered their heart or mind. The Jews, though, it had entered their hearts and minds by the revelation of God. And they had heard that God had kept that word now. That he had made the promise that he had made to their fathers through the prophets. 
centuries and generations before. He had kept those promises. And this message was now declared to them as they declared it in the synagogue of Antioch of Syria, on the island of Cyprus, in the synagogues of Antioch of Pisidia, in Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, where Timothy and his mother and grandmother became believers of this message, though they had not seen, they believed. Now these brethren in Colossae, having not seen, they believed, and that faith was pouring forth its fruit in them as it was everywhere that the message was believed. See, this is common. It's not common for the message to be heard and nominally embraced and nothing happens. That's not common in the kingdom. It's common in religious circles, yes, but not in the kingdom and the work of our God by his chosen witnesses and the message that they delivered as it's delivered by others who believe, who, faithful men to whom the message was entrusted, who are also then delivered to others. And it's been delivered to us, brethren. It's been delivered to us. And that's why we haven't been content with hearing other things. Amen. We want to hear this message. It's the message that we believed. Amen. And it's the message that these chosen witnesses and their associates continued to speak for the believers to mature and be stable and to increase, Amen. to grow in grace and knowledge. As we've often said, the thing that brings you in is the thing that brings you along and takes you all the way in. Yeah. It's, that's, that's, the, that's the record that we have, isn't it? Because the apostles and their associates did not take the word of God and just run hither and yon with it, dealing with political issues and social issues and domestic issues and economic issues and personal issues about people's personal problems and so forth. We don't hear them addressing the issue of slavery, do we? And it was everywhere. Well, I guess we do hear them addressing the issue of slavery, don't we? <laughs> In this letter to Philemon, but it's not the kind, it's not the way that it would be addressed today, is it? Not at all. Now, of course, that's utterly unspeakable in most places. I've mentioned this in the places where I preach, the one particular place where I preach every day. And in the audience are some black Americans, and they've heard me speak about this, and they nod their heads. They know it's true. They know it's true. That the way these things are spoken about in the churches today is, are not the way the apostles spoke about them. They did not speak about personal social issues in that day. So we have to ask. Those who are honest and who love the truth have to ask then, why are these things spoken of in the churches today? When that's not the foundation of our faith, how dare anyone try to build on that foundation with any other thing than what has been delivered to us? How, how dare anyone try to build upon this foundation with wood, hay, or stubble, which cannot stand the fire? Amen. And yet that's what we have. We've all come out of that. At one time, place, or manner, or another. We've all come out of that. Because we want to both be good material. We believe that we are, since God has produced us, we are good material, good building material. And we want to build on the foundation with good material as well. We've seen these things because we believe. God has granted us a spirit of wisdom and understanding, and that's not, that's not, arrogance speaking it is confidence in what God has said and does how dare anyone not have that confidence how dare anyone act as if these things are debatable they only are in academic circles where people just kick it around uh, to uh, demonstrate what they know 
to fill in the time, to develop their careers, to manipulate others, to demonstrate uh, their superiority of knowledge over others, to actually hold people down, to tie weights around their neck, burdens on the people that they themselves have not been able to bear, all of these things that the Lord revealed was being done in his generation. Those things still happen in our generation. All around the world. The brethren in Kenya talked about it. The brethren in Pakistan talked about it. The brethren in India probably talked about it as well. It happens in religious circles all over the world in different ways, in different forms and manners, but that's what happens. Men lording it over others for their own good, for the sake of their own careers, for the sake of their own pocketbooks, for the sake of their own status, they do that. They haven't seen themselves because they haven't believed, and they don't want anybody else to see either. They don't want anybody else to see any more than they have seen. Because when this message is declared with power, people's eyes will be opened, as ours have been. It will happen everywhere. The places where, the few places where we've been and other places in the world, it's happened that way. People's eyes were opened. They were drawn to it. Their lives were transformed. They became bold, we know. They became bold. Place in, places in Pakistan, at threat, under threat of their lives, they became bold and continue in these things. In India, in Kenya, despite great burdens, despite little power, <laughs> as far as the world accords power, they have taken up the work and made great progress in declaring these things and establishing the believers, in, in delivering these things to faithful men who will also teach others. And the word of God is growing and multiplying. God is giving the growth as they do the work that he's appointed them to do. We've seen it. We've been part of it. We are part of it. All of you are part of it as well. And a couple of us, of course, are physically there for a short time. And so we saw that. How God's word bears fruit. Though they have not seen. They have believed just as we. And we're not talking about reproducing ourselves, cloning ourselves in some religious fashion. You know, congregations of the word of truth. Although some of them choose to call themselves that, well, that's their choice. We're not advocating any such thing at all. And we caution them. In, in some sense, we caution them not to sometimes, but they choose to do that. We're calling them to believe the things that we have heard. The things that God has delivered to us. And such faith impacts the whole person. We can be sure that where you see no fruit, there's no faith. Because the word of God will not fall to the ground. It continues, it moves forward, and it produces the fruit of maturity. Stability. Because believing is seeing. You know where you walk. You make progress in grace and truth. And you arrive ever closer, ever closer to our appointed destiny. Because believing is seeing. God's grace and peace to you, brethren. Brother Aaron will have our exhortation tonight then.